So we're going to talk about. So today we're going to talk about unraveling RC usage mysteries with additional use cases. This is a follow on to the December 7th presentation. And uh, so this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be a really quick review of uh, last time's presentation. We're going to look at the use cases and we're going to go through some of them. So a quick review. And uh, the URL at the bottom of the page is the URL for the previous presentation, in case you want to go back and look at that again. But uh, to start off with, the big issue, the thing that leads to RCU and also hazard pointers, as noted there, is that global agreement is expensive. Getting all the CPUs, all the threads, everything to come to agreement on something takes time. And this is due to the finite lead of speed of light and also the fact that items, though very small, are not zero sized. And as I said last December, uh, if you'd have told me 50 years ago that I would be saying that the speed of light is too slow and that atoms are too big, um, not for space travel, but for computing, I don't know what I would have said, but I guarantee you I would not have believed you. But here I am. So the way around this is we use both spatial and temporal synchronization. Uh, read or write locking strictly uses temporal. We're going to add spatial to that. RC is one way to do that. And again, hazard pointers is another way. So we'll do a real quick run through of how that works here. So here's the core RCU API, and hey, we have Paul. the temporal. Yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, I think perhaps the Zoom menu bar might be blocking your titles on your screen. Oh, really? Yes. OK. We try As in other people can see this too. That's interesting. Let's try yeah. clicking here and making it go away. Let's try it. No, that doesn't make it go away. Hmm. No, it didn't really seem to do anything there. Yeah, it just looks like there might be a black box above the titles. Um, so we're, we're, we're like right now seeing RCU Saman. Hmm. Okay, uh, so right now you see RCU core, a bunch of garbage, and then spatial. That's right. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I love Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see if I can do something to make this go away. Or perhaps if you just read the title out and then we'll make sure to catch this in the slides. That okay, we what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing and start again and see if that causes something to explode. Okay. Okay, so I stopped and then I start again over here. And then I do that and I hit share. And uh, there, is that better? So, Yes, and yes, the title you, we see it. Yeah, okay, we see the majority. I mean, the the, the top of the T is probably chopped off. It but, sure uh, is, but the rest of it is there. Yeah. Thank okay, you. well, I'll read the titles out, but now people can see them better. So thank you so there much. There we are. Okay, thanks for calling my attention to that. Uh, um, as I said, I love Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Although you got to admit, uh, if you'd have told me that uh, I'd be presenting to people scattered all over the place uh, in the comfort of my own office, uh, 50 years ago, I wouldn't believe that either. So yeah, how it goes. That's just how it goes, I guess. All right, so core RCU API, temporal versus spatial. So we've got the blue stuff as temporal. So we mark readers starting with RC read lock and RCU read unlock, giving the time a reader starts and ends. Uh, synchronized RCU and call RCU are the synchronous and asynchronous respectively interfaces to wait for all pre-existing readers. Um, and then, those, so that's the stuff dealing with time. Dealing with space, we have RCU dereference to load an RCU protected pointer. Uh, dereference protected for the update side, if there's a lock involved. RCU assign pointer to update a pointer. And those could, in theory, just be assignment statements, uh, but uh, CPUs and especially compilers can be a little bit obnoxious at times if you're trying to write concurrent code. And those keep both the CPU and the compiler from doing silly things. These are just seven elements of the API. There's quite a few more. And at the bottom is a URL of an Eldabin article talking about those as of January 2019. There's been a few added since, but not that many. OK, going on to uh, RCU Semantics Graphical. So we've got that core API, and we're just talking about three of them now, RC Read Lock and RC Read Unlock, as you can see, delimiting a reader. And we'll start in the upper left-hand corner there. So in this upper left-hand corner, we have a synchronized RC that started after a reader did. And that means that reader might see the data that was removed. It might have a reference to that data. And that means synchronized RC has to refrain from returning until that reader gets done, at which point you can free the old memory without worrying about messing up the reader. And let me tell you, 
user after free is a bad idea and having RCU in conjunction with user after free doesn't help, okay? So uh, that's important. However, on the other hand, if the synchronized RCU started first, well, that means that the, and this is, we're in the upper right-hand corner now. So in that upper right-hand corner, the synchronized RCU started first, that means that the reader can't possibly see the data that was removed. So that reader can't be inconvenienced by that memory being free. So it's okay for synchronized RCU to return despite the fact there might be later readers that are still ongoing because those later readers can't see the stuff that was removed. And so that's the key benefit here. We've taken the update and split it in two pieces. We have a removal part that's visible to the readers and then we have a free part. And so we put enough time between those two so that the uh, we wait for the pre-existing readers don't have to wait for the later ones. Uh, we can do both. We can have both belt and suspenders. That's in the lower left here. If we have a reader that uh, showed up after the removal, so it can't see the data that's being freed, it's, and it gets done before the memory is freed, well, that's doubly good because it didn't see the memory and it wasn't freed until it was done anyway. The bad case, the you have a bug in RCU case, is in the lower right-hand side. Uh, we cannot have a reader that starts before a synchronized RCU starts and ends afterwards, because you can see right there, it could get a reference to that old data, and it was, might still be using it when it's freed. And that's, again, a bad idea. So that kind of gives you a graphical idea of what the constraints RCU puts on time ordering. OK, uh, the next slide is RCU managed again, but looking at restrictions. Um, RCU gets its performance by being a specialized tool, all right? It doesn't try to be everything to everybody, and that allows it to work very well where it's, where, where it's designed to work. And so uh, as a general rule of thumb, the more you're reading and the less you're updating, the better RCU is going to work for you. And as another rule of thumb, the more your algorithm can tolerate stale and inconsistent data, the better RCU is going to work for you. This may sound strange, but the speed of light applies to things outside the computer. And what that means is that if we get a change in the computer, by the time that change is in the computer, it's already old news. And so if we have an algorithm that's check, tracking external state, and the external state doesn't have to be all that external, even like devices connected to the CPU is external from this viewpoint, then we're already dealing with stale and consistent state anyway. And so a little bit of additional time inconsistency is often OK. In the lower left-hand corner, that red triangle, that's the place where RCU is not going to be working very well for you. Um, and 20 years ago, I'd have said, just don't use RCU there. Uh, but one of the really cool things about working with the Linux kernel community is they're able to come up with uh, new things that I hadn't considered and teach me new things. And they taught me two reasons why you do want to use it there. We'll be talking about the first one. We'll be showing a case where RCU, even though you're updating all the time, RCU is providing some protection to simplify uh, non-blocking synchronization. Uh, the other case is if uh, you're not reading that often, when you're reading, there are severe latency constraints. And in that case, you might want to use RCU as well. An additional thing to consider that RCU is frequently used for linked data structures. Now, in December, we saw a case, the phase state change, where there was no, no pointers or links anywhere in sight. Um, so it can be used in other cases, but the majority of the uses, the most common uses, involve linked data structures. All right, so that's the restrictions. Uh, here we're just kind of showing uh, the cost of global agreement the title there. And this is showing reader-writer locking first. And so what's going to happen is we've got a bunch of readers. And let's say we've got something where we have readers all the time. And that means if an updater shows up, we have to wait for all the readers to get done. And then we have to wait for the agreement that the readers are done to propagate throughout the machine so that no new readers start up, then we can update. And once the updater is done, we have to wait for agreement that the updater is done to propagate through the machine, and then the readers can start again. And this big red area there, those five red bars, are that's lost time that can't be made up. And of course, as you add CPUs, that red area gets bigger. Uh, it gets bigger in two ways. First, you have more bars, obviously, and secondly, the agreement latency for larger machines tends to be larger than for smaller machines. And that can be a problem. I mean, uh, obviously, this is a problem for, in terms of latency, even for uh, aggressive real time. If you want your readers to show up and you want it to be sub millisecond, this can be a problem. But even for more normal workloads, data, data centers, for example, where you have web based 
latencies. If your updater takes any particular length of time, uh, which often they do, uh, this can be unacceptable in data centers as well. So we want to do this with RCU on the bottom of the slide. So here we have readers all over the place and we split the updater in two, like we had before on the previous slide, we had a removal and a free. So we got the removal and the free there, updater one and updater two in the middle bar, the kind of greenish blue. Um, sorry if it looks different to you, I'm red green colorblind, so I'll give you approximations, approximate names of the colors. And what's happening here is we have very little overhead. Now, uh, there's going to be cache misses. The updater removes something, that's going to cause a cache miss, so the readers that are running right at that time may see an extra little bit of time for a cache miss, but there isn't the big agreement latency, no big red areas. Uh, so we can get much better latencies and much better efficiency as well. All right, um, and so let's go back and look at a particular slide from the 7th, December 7th. And this is the one where we show the spatial and the temporal synchronization. So time is advancing from top to bottom. And because we aren't, don't have that big red thing, if we had the big red thing, then readers would either see the old value or the new value and they'd be at separate times and everything would be very, very understandable and very organized and very control freakery. But uh, we'd have that big, gap in the middle. We'd be paying for that privilege. So what we do is we use the address space in conjunction with the time to straighten things out. So above the horizontal dashed blue line, everybody agrees that we're dealing with the old data. There's only the old data. The new data isn't there yet. If we look at below the second blue dashed line, everybody agrees that there is new data and no old data anymore. Between the lines, different readers may get different either the old data or the new data, but a given reader, any given reader, will get one or the other. It won't get both. And so it turns out, now there's some cases where that's not sufficient, and we'll talk about a way of working around that later in this presentation, a particular use case, of uh, the quasi-multi-version uh, <coughs> multi, multi uh, consistency control uh, slides. We'll talk about that. But uh, for the meantime, uh, if we don't need that degree of consistency, we just need a given reader to be seeing the same consistent results, this will guarantee the consistency using time on the one hand and address space on the other. Okay, so we can map that back onto the previous slide and show the readers in blue that are guaranteed to see the old value. The readers in green are guaranteed to see the new value and the kind of greenish bluish color in between there um, are ones that might see one or might see the other. But once a given CPU or thread starts seeing the new values, that CPU or thre thread will see the new values forever after. So we don't know ahead of time on the top thread, which of those two readers, the uh, third and the fourth counting from the left, uh, which of them will start seeing the new values, one or the other will, or, or maybe, maybe they'll both see the old values. But once uh, it starts seeing the new values, it'll see the new values forever. So that kind of gives you a pictorial representation of what will be happening uh, to the readers as the update is going on. Okay, so that was our review. Again, uh, we had the URL of the previous presentation for people who want to dig deeper uh, into a review. But uh, we'll look at uh, the, the diagram of the use cases. Now, phase state change, we talked about last December, and we're not going to talk about it again. Quasi-reader writer lock, and we spent a lot of time on last December. And we're going to just add a couple of twists to it this time, uh, if we have time. Um, I'm going to go through all of these if we have time. If we run short of time, I'll skip one uh, the ones that I believe are less important. But of course, Murphy says those will be the ones you need next, right? Yeah, life's like that sometimes. Okay, let's start with the add-only list. So the add-only list is over in the lower left corner there. Um, it's connected just to the link publish subscribe, and that's intentional. It is very um, basic. Uh, it doesn't add much to just raw RCU. All right, so let's illustrate this with code. But first, we're going to start with a typical add delete list, because this is going to be more familiar to those of you who have been through the Linux kernel. So we have a reader and an updater. And these will be running in separate threads. The reader uh, is in, started by RC read lock and RC, ends with RC read unlock, as you'd expect. Lists for each entry RCU just as an iterator that goes through a list. The list is going through is this RL thing. And the 
iteration variable is p. Okay, NXT is just the field in the structure that uh, has the uh, list head pointers that is used to do the iteration. So what this is going to do is it's going to go through the list, and for each element, it's going to call do something. And uh, it may be that that element gets removed while we're doing this, but it won't be freed. So the do something will have real memory to work on. It's not going to have anything yanked out from under it. Of course, that means the updater has to take care. And so let's take a look at the updater. There's a global spin lock ML, and it's going to acquire that, and then it releases it at the third to the bottom statement. And that avoids any interference from other updaters. We have multiple updaters trying to run it once. That lock's going to protect us. That lock has no effect whatsoever on the readers. The readers are just still piling through while we're doing this, as we saw in the previous diagrams. So the next line does list first entry to pick up the first element of the list, whatever it is. And then the next line does list LRCU. That removes that element. Uh, the underbar RCU causes it to leave the next pointer in place. That means a reader that happens to be looking at that element just as we remove it will still be able to get out of that element to the next element in the list. OK, so we uh, list del by itself would poison both the previous and the next pointers. List LRCU poisons just the previous pointer, leaves the next pointer there so the readers can keep going through the list. Then we, uh, we've got some pointer Q that uh, we somehow allocated and initialized somewhere earlier. Don't worry about how that happened. Um, I want it to fit on one slide, and it does this way. So we do list add RCU to add that to the beginning of the list. So we take that Q pointer and add it to RL list. We release the lock. So now another updater can, can come in and do things. We do synchronize RCU to wait for all the pre-existing readers. And those pre-existing readers are the only ones that could possibly have a reference to P because we use list L, L RCU to remove it. So once we get done waiting for all readers, once that synchronized RCU returns, we can safely do a K free of P and get rid of that thing. So this is an add delete list, the standard thing, sort of thing you'd see in the Linux kernel. Usually you either add or delete rather than doing both at once as we do here, but again, one slide. So let's look at what we'd have to do this thing to make it be, uh, so we remove code to make an add only list. With one exception, we have to add a true to keep locked happy on the list for each entry RCU. That true doesn't affect the operation of it, it just tells locked up, hey, I understand I'm not in a reside critical section and it's okay, don't complain. So because we're never removing anything, we don't have to mark RC read lock or RC read unlock. So those can go away. On the updater side, we're not removing, we're just adding. So we can obviously get rid of the thing to grab the first element and delete it. The list first entry and list LRCU, those go away. And we didn't remove anything, so we don't have to do a synchronized RCU and we don't have anything free. So those go away. So the red crossed out lines are going to go away. The next slide will show what we have left over. So the reader just iterates the list and does something with each one. Uh, we're only adding, we're not removing, so the elements can't go away. We don't have to worry about them going away. They don't ever. And then the updater is only adding something. Um, there actually is code in the Linux kernel that does this approach. It may seem kind of silly. Why would you, and that's a memory leak, right? You're only adding, you're never deleting. But there are some situations where you occasionally have changes. You need to keep track of the old state that's happened since this boot. And uh, so they, the list just grows, but for various reasons, it can't grow very far. Perhaps uh, you have devices that are inserted, uh, they can't be removed, or they might have devices that can be brought online. Once they're brought online, you add them. If they're removed, you still keep track of the same list. And uh, when you add them again, you reuse the entry, for example. That way the list can only grow as big as there are the number of devices. And you never have to worry about deleting anything because it may be removed, but you still keep track of the fact that it used to be there. So that's one use for that. OK, uh, here's how the thing operates. And this time I'm showing the allocation and initialization that I left out of the uh, example. So we have our list RL, the blue, red box in the top. And time is going to advance from left to right. So we have this list. We have the arrow showing the operation that changed it. We're color coding it. The red boxes are things that readers can get to. The green boxes are things that readers have no way of accessing. I mean, aside from just going and digging through memory, which is a bad idea anyway. All right, so we allocate the thing, it's uninitialized, and we end up with the second state there with the RL pointer still being null, but having a block of memory to play with. We initialize it, and now it's no longer defined. We've got A equals one, B equals two, C equals three, and so on. Uh, we use list add RCU, and suddenly readers can get at it, and they use list for each entry RCU to iterate across it, and life is good. And the reason this works 
is the list add RC was careful to write, make the compiler write the pointer in one shot. It doesn't write a byte at a time or something. And list for each entry RCU forces the compiler to load it in one shot. And uh, uh, if an architecture like deck alpha requires special instructions to make the ordering work out on the read side, it provides it. A uh, num fair number of architectures do require list add RCU to add appropriate ordering. So it does so when, when needed. So that's kind of what is happening as we run the update and the readers are going through all the time. And so we have a, a way to add stuff to the list without blocking the readers to wait for an addition and still having things come out straight. A reader is going to either see the null list or it'll see the new element, but it's not going to see some something strange. Okay, so if we've added three elements to the list over time, it looks like this. We have a previous and next pointer. That's the NXT field we saw earlier. And we have our backwards and forward pointers. The pointers loop around the back of red because I'm going to leave them out of all of the next slides that have this list because they get in the way. All right, they're still there. Um, you, you can put them there in your imagination, but we need to decorate the list and, and we've got to make room for it. And so those pointers go. We might have a lock. We'll have some cases that use that and we have other data. Uh, for example, in the previous slide, we had A, B, and C being in the other data. So the way RCU is working is that we're spreading out synchronization responsibility among different mechanisms. So in this case, we're only adding, we have the red dotted line indicating the synchronization responsibility of the ML lock. So the updater did a spin lock on, it, on ML and it was doing that to protect the previous and next pointers of the elements. It's insert, inserting a new element and it's gonna have to mess with the previous and next pointer of the adjacent elements that are being inserted between. And then RCU um, published subscribe in blue there. This is embodied with a list for each entry RCU is making sure that the initialization is, is visible to the readers. They aren't gonna get a pointer to something and see what was there before the initialization happened. So that's how we split things out. Uh, in some cases, the other data might be mutable. And so in that case, the lock would come into play. Um, and that's the yellow boxes there. And typically what would happen is the lock would be responsible for guarding the other data. Um, and it may seem strange using RCU, why are we throwing a lock in? The key thing is that ML lock is a global lock. If we have much of any contention on that, life gets hard. These locks, in the data structures themselves, those are per data structure, they're separate. And so the contention gets spread out over all the elements. And uh, as long as you don't have some kind of a hotspot in your data, that means your contention stays reasonably low or can stay reasonably low. Okay, so uh, going kind of summing up RCU to add only list, we take publish subscribe for link structure. And that was that white box in the lower left corner in the in the uh, you are here diagram sometime back and we don't add anything to it that's all we have so this is a very simple uh it's it's very basic a very primal if you will use of rcu which is why it comes first okay let's advance to the delete only list if we have an add only list we have delete only lists as well it may sound equally silly but uh, we'll talk about a possible use case so we're over here it's uh, based on existence guarantee so it's a little less primal than add only list was and if we start with the add delete list, I'm gonna go through it again. This is exactly the same as uh, some slides back. We'll look at what we changed to get from an add delete list to a delete list. Rem and we remove code for delete only list here. And uh, not much happens to the reader. I mean, we could, I mean, there's a embedded in that list for each entry RCU as an RCU do reference. And it could be read once instead, but that's not gonna make much difference, especially not in recent kernels, okay? Uh, but we're not adding anything, so we get rid of the addition in the updater. Uh, so when I said that uh, delete only list is less primal than an add only list, I meant it. You can see that there's much less change in complexity from the add delete list. So why would we have a delete only list? You Maybe you have something that's keeping track of memory devices and maybe um, you have to stop using them if they're showing failure rates, if they're showing ECC errors, for example. And in that case, you might have something keeping track of each memory, but once it's become unreliable, you may just delete it from the list and never pay attention to it again. Um, and uh, you may not have a way to actually plug a new memory into this system. It's, that's not that common a capability these days. Um, and so in that case, the memory could only go away. It couldn't come back and you'd have a delete only list. 
I believe I've seen one or two of these in Linux kernel, but I couldn't tell you where they are or if they still exist. Okay, uh, so if we just show the code, uh, you can see that it's the same pretty much. We've gotten rid of the ad and uh, here we are. So this is how the delete only list works. We're adding a, uh, another color, yellow, and that's a case where uh, readers can't get at it, at it, but old readers might still be there. So if we start with a list and it has a cat and tux on it, it's all red. There could be readers there anywhere. We do list LRCU on the cat. Okay. At this point, RL points to tux now, and new readers have no way of getting to the cat. So there might still be readers that happen to load the pointer from RL before we did the list LRCU, and they might be there for quite some time. They might be, who knows what they're doing to the cat, uh, especially with the name Schrodinger. But in any case, it's like old readers. That means if we do synchronize RCU, those old readers have to have been completed before synchronized RCU returns. So the cat now becomes green, it's safe. No readers have access to it and we can safely K free it. Okay, so this is just going through how the delete only list is working and how it's keeping the readers safe. We have very similar looking synchronization responsibilities. Um, we're deleting from the list and that's guarded by a global lock ML. We saw the spin lock and spin unlock of that thing a few slides ago. And uh, we still have to prevent the compiler from interfering with readers. Um, and now we don't have to worry about initialization because we're not adding anything. However, we do need the compiler uh, to store the changed pointers in a single instruction store so that the reader, which has to use a single instruction load, doesn't see some mashup of a couple pointers. That is bad for the actuarial statistics of your kernel as you may already have experienced. And again, just like before, we could have a per element lock in case we have mutable data, where we just scan the list to find what we want. We do that locklessly. When we get to the element, we may find out that we need to modify something and we may need to do that under the protection of a lock. So we have that option with the delete only list as well. Uh, delete only list is interesting in that we're taking the existence guarantee and removing something from it. We're no longer relying on the publish subscribe piece, but we are relying on all the other things that make up the existence guarantee. Okay, so let's talk about the existence guarantee. And this is right below the, existence, uh, the lead only list. It looks like the lead only list adds to it, but that was a head fake. It's actually removing something for it. So the existence guarantee is actually less primal than the lead only list. So what we're doing here in this code is we're going to do a reader then updater sort of a thing, all right? So we have a reader and, and we start with the RC read lock there and the reader ends with the RC read unlock about a little, about two thirds of the way down. And we're gonna look for an element and we're gonna put the a point of that element in Q. So we start off with Q being null. We go through the list using list for each, each entry RSU, just like we have for all the previous examples. That's going to just go step through the list each in turn. And if we have the right key, we set Q equals P to remember that we found the thing. And then we acquire the spin lock. And so what's happening here is RSU is making sure the element stays around long enough for us to acquire a spin lock. If we didn't have those RSU read lock and the RSU done lock, we could end up with somebody removing the element and freeing it just as we're crying the spin lock and that's not good for your kernel either, all right? But because we're in the RC read side critical section, we got that RC read lock protecting us at the top, we can do that spin lock and uh, we can then break to get out of the loop. If we found an element, Q will be non-null. We check for it being deleted and we'll see how that works on the next slide. But if it's already been deleted, we don't want to do anything. We only want to do some update if it's been deleted. In that case, now we don't under RCU protection anymore, but we do hold the lock. And we'll see on the next slide that prevents the updater from remove, removing the element. Then we release the lock and we're good. Okay, on the next slide, um, we're going to uh, acquire the lock. We get the first entry. Now we add a spin lock. So we're acquiring the per element lock and only now are we setting deleted to true and deleting it. Okay, so a reader might come in and it might um, uh, 
get its lock just before we do, in which case our spin lock will wait and the reader will go and it'll do its thing and it will, um, it will uh, call that function, okay? If it shows up just afterwards, it's gonna see the deleted equals true and it's not gonna do anything. Okay, we do our list at RCU for the addition. We release the global lock and then we do a synchronized RCU to wait for the readers and then we can safely free it, okay? Now, here uh, we are relying on the lock and we're relying on the lock to cover not just the other data as we did before, but the entire element. And that's because the deleter has to hold the per element lock to do the removal. So it's protecting the next and, and previous pointers of the element being removed as well, okay? Otherwise we have the same sort of thing. The uh, uh, global lock is also protecting the deletion. It's also protecting any additions that might be happening. Um, it also, also the list for each entry RCU is ensuring that the readers see valid pointers and also see initial, initialization of added elements. Okay, so again, we have a uh, delegation of different responsibilities to different synchronization mechanisms, making it all work together. Okay, so again, the lock is doing more than it was before. It's protecting the other data and it's also preventing the corresponding node from being removed. If you hold the lock, uh, it's either already been removed or it won't be removed, one of the two. Okay, and so we're starting with RCU. RCU to existence guarantee transformation, if you will. Uh, we start with both wait for readers and the public subscribe, both of the white boxes that were at the corners of the bottom corners of the diagram earlier. And we're using a heap allocator and we're using deferred reclamation. Deferred reclamation being either synchronized RCU or uh, call RCU or K3 RCU or some of the newer fire and forget style cell primitives. All right. Existence guarantee is fairly powerful. If you're in a reader, you're the thing is guaranteed to exist. Uh, but sometimes it can be expensive. And so for those times we have type safe memory. And so type safe memory is uh, uh, similar to existence guarantee. It's a little bit weaker. It's a little bit harder to use, but you get in some cases you get more efficiency. So let's take a look here. The way type safe memory is, uh, is implemented in the Linux kernel is you have a slab allocator. Okay, you do a, a, came, a came in cache create and you pass the slab type safe by RCU flag, okay? And this is actually an approximation of real academic art, uh, type, type safe memory, but it seems to work fairly well for us. And sometimes approximations are better than the original. And the, the advantage of this is you get better cache locality. If you have a, type, a slab type safe by RCU slab allocator, if you free something, it can be immediately reallocated. You don't have to wait for a grace period to free it. You can just free it right now, it'll be reallocated maybe immediately. And that means that the memory being reallocated is still hot in the cache. On the other hand, if you wait for a grace period as you do for the existence guarantee, that memory may be colder in the cache and you may take a bit of a performance hit when you reallocate it. But there's no free lunch, especially since this is RCU and uh, synchronization in general doesn't have much free lunch if you may have noticed. So that means that the readers need a validation step because you didn't wait for a grace period. So you may be a reader going and grabbing something and it may be freed and reallocated off from under you. Um, so you have to make sure you've, you're dealing with the thing you think you are. And so take a look at this, we're gonna have a TSM state diagram. This is specific to the Linux kernel. So we have the slab type safe by RCU slab cache, a KMM cache thing, and we can allocate from it. KMM cache alloc there. Once we've done that, uh, we're over on the far left, it's in use. At some point, we may decide to free it, in which case it goes back to the slab. If that element happened to the last thing in that slab, we have an empty slab, which we free, but when we free that back to the page allocator, we wait for an RC grace period at that point. All right. So uh, any readers that might have access to it are known to be done and have left, dropped the references before we go to the far right hand free pages pool. Of course, if KMM cache Alex says, hey, I need something and there's no nothing to be had, then the slab cache is gonna grab a new slab, grab some pages and make a new slab out of it. And so that'll come around the top on the right-hand side. So we've got a kind of figure eight here that the uh, cache is run through. But the interesting part is the figure eight on the, on the left because 
a given piece of memory can go around and around that circle really, really fast. There are no grace periods here. You just free it. It can be immediately reallocated. It can be used for a little bit. Be freed of it and just whirl around really quickly. And most readers, perhaps not all of them, but the ones I'm aware of, they need to stop this. They need a way of stopping that churn. And uh, that is what the validation is about. All right. So one way to stop the churn, and we're going to look at some example code here that's been kind of brutally uh, chopped down. And there's the full stuff on, on a particular tag at, in the dash rcu tree at the bottom of the slide there. I don't intend to put that upstream, but there's a tag keeping it for posterity. So what you could do is use a reference counter. And the way to avoid freed items is you use something called atomic add unless. So atomic add unless does an atomic add unless you have a specified value. In this case, we'll use zero. All right. And so what will happen is we'll do an atomic add unless. And so what will happen is we'll do an atomic increment unless the value was already zero, in which case it says, sorry, I couldn't do it. What that does is it allows us to reject items that are currently being freed. Uh, of course, it might have been freed, then reallocated before we figured out what was going on. So even if we succeed in getting a reference, we also have to recheck the key and make sure it's the thing, still the thing we want. So we have to conditionally acquire a reference. If we acquire the reference, we have to recheck the key. So let's take a look and see how we do that. This is just showing a struct foo we're going to use. It's got a, a list head, which um, is um, used in the uh, example code and RCU, we're not going to pay attention to it. We're just going to assume that uh, we know how to make RCU protected lists since we've gone through that several times in this presentation already. We have an atomic reference count there, ref, and we have a key, which is an integer. Now we have to have our own KMM cache. That's our food cache there in the middle. And we create it, just KMM crash create as you always would, but you have that red slab type safe by RCU flag you pass in to tell it, hey, uh, wait for a grace period before freeing up an entire slab, before handing an entire slab back to the page pool. Uh, you came and cache destroy just like you always would. One nice thing about that is it finds your memory leaks for you, of which I had a few as I was debugging the code. Okay, you have to allocate initialize specially, and we have a full alloc that's going to do that for us on this page. We do a KMM cache alloc, and if we didn't get anything, we return null telling the sad story. Otherwise, we set the key to the desired value that was passed in, and then we do an atomic set release. Okay, so we have an initial reference of one, and that's kind of an implicit reference for the data structure. It's the caller's responsibility to add it to that data structure, but we've given it the reference to begin with. And that the atomic set release means that if somebody does an atomic add unless, if they get a reference, they'll see the new value of the key. Okay, so that ordering is important. All right, with that in place, let's take a look at getting keys. So the reader, after it finds the element, is going to have to do a foo get key to make sure that it's got a reference and the thing has the same identity. So it's going to do this inside an RC read lock. So we've got RC read lock at the stop, top. We've got an RC read unlock at the bottom just before the return. Now we do a foo lookup, which uh, we aren't showing here, but it does a lookup. And we give it the key and it gives us back a pointer. It could give us back a null pointer, in which case we're just going to return null. And that's the empty then clause there on that if statement. But if we did get a pointer, we're going to try to atomic add unless it. So if it is zero, that's the last argument, we atomically add one. So this could be considered an atomic ink unless, but we have an atomic add unless. If that returns false, that means that the reference was zero. So it means somebody freed it while, after, while we were looking it up or just after we came back. And in that case, uh, we didn't get the reference. And we set p equals null in the then clause of the else if. Now, if we get to the last else if there, um, that means we got a reference. So we check to see if the key is matches. If it doesn't, then we have to call foo put to undo our reference count. And my failing to put that there was, in fact, one of my bugs that got me memory leaks. So we foo put to undo our reference, and we set p equals null, and then we return whatever we had for p. So we'll return a p pointing to the element if we got a reference and the key still matched after getting the reference, or we return null otherwise. Either we didn't find the thing in the search structure to begin with, we were unable to get the reference, or we got a reference, but its identity had changed in the meantime. Okay, 
So this is example validation code that we used to deal with the fact that we aren't waiting for a grace period before we free the element. We just free it. Uh, we might reallocate it immediately. And this per overhead on the readers is the price we're paying for not needing the grace period on the hot uh, free allocation pass, path. OK, so any questions about that? That's a little bit of stuff really quickly. So I'll give people a chance to ask. Going once, going twice. OK, sold. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, this probably looks familiar if you've been through the latest kernel. We do an atomic deck and test that takes our reference count and it decrements it. If the result was zero, it returns true, otherwise it returns false. If it returns true, then uh, we've got a zero reference now and there aren't any readers referencing it. And if a reader tries to reference it, the, the, it'll fail in the, on the previous slide. The atomic add and less will fail. So we can just KMM cache free it, all right? Um, now, that means that we may have readers with uh, pointing to the free list, but it's a special free list because we have a, a slab type safe by RCU. We're in the free list. We won't go back to the page allocator without a grace period beforehand. So we can be recycled as this same type by another KMM cache alloc, but we won't get actually free and used for something else. All right. So that means that the layout of the structure remains the same and we can count on it not morphing into something else. It may morph into a different instance of the type, but that's why we have the reference allocation and the recheck of the key in the foo get code. All right. So one question you might have is, this is complicated. Why not just use locking? I mean, we got this thing. It stays around. Why not just acquire a lock? And uh, the problem is that KMM cache alloc might return uninitialized memory. And we'll, we'll see how that happens in another slide. And that means that the initialization, I mean, right, as it stood before, we just set the reference to zero. And if it was the first round for this particular element, it just it set it from garbage to zero. If it had come back through KMM cache free, back through KMM cache alloc, the atomic deck can test had set it to zero, and we were setting it to zero again. OK, so we were setting a zero, but not changing its value. The problem is spin locks are a little more complicated than that. And uh, uh, if we do a spin lock in it, and somebody's trying to acquire that spin lock at the same time, that's not going to be a good thing. That's going to get bad really fast, and we can't allow that. Uh, and the other thing is, I mean, if you use Cayman cache alloc like before, that's the problem we have. If we use Cayman cache Zalek, that'd be another option. The problem there is that's going to clobber the lock as well. Um, you could imagine locks where setting a zero releases it. But the problem is that just because it was free doesn't mean there aren't readers paying attention to it. So you can end up with a reader trying to acquire the lock just as, just as we zeroed the thing. And that would be bad as well because it would sort of automatically release the locks of all those readers. So um, uh, as it stands, the reason this happens, and here's what you might try to do, right? You might do Cayman cache alloc, you might do a conditional initialization. That's the red box over there. We just used to go straight to unuse. Um, the problem is that when we get a new slab, it's not zeroed. And so that means if we if we did a KMM cache alloc and the memory we got was just newly allocated, it hadn't been KMM cache free, it had just come out of a free page, it's got arbitrary stuff in it. And so we have no way to determine how to initialize it. Now, it may well be that we should change that. It could be the Linux kernel really needs to have a way of saying, hey, this is a slab type safe by RCU thing, so zero the new pages into it, please. Um, and uh, that might be worth looking into because that would, if you did that, then you could use a, just a spin lock. Uh, the spin lock would stay a spin lock as you went around. You would check to see if uh, there was a flag set zero, if it was, um, um, excuse me, uh, you could, uh, and the flag was zero, you knew that it was a new slab just coming in. You would set it to one, and that would, and the flag being one would tell you that it had been already initialized. You wouldn't have to initialize it, all right? But that's uh, something for another time. Uh, do readers need atomics? Uh, it turns out they don't. Uh, I thought they did. Uh, John Cara explained that to me a little while ago. There's the uh, lore link if you want to look up the email. Um, and the trick is that, uh, and ext 4 uses this, you can have another object you have a reference to that's, and you, you could know that the type safe item 
has a longer life time time than the stabilized item. In that case, just the fact you have a reference to this other object and the type safe item is tied to it, has a, has a reference to it, you can just check that non-atomically and be good. Okay, so that was kind of cute. That was a surprise to me. Another uh, fun thing about uh, working with the Linux kernel community. And uh, to move from RC to type safe memory, uh, you, it's kind of like moving to existence guarantee, except for a heap allocator, you got a slab allocator. And instead of having deferred reclamation all the time, you have deferred reclamation on the slab only. So as you hand pages back, you deferred reclamation at that point and not on every free. So um, let's take a look at lightweight garbage collector. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, we're, uh, I'm gonna go through this quickly. Um, it's something that's kind of easy in concept, but the details can get a little ugly. One thing that can happen is that there's non-blocking algorithms that are subject to something called ABA. And what happens is that reallocated memory can cause failure. And so an example is a, a FIFO stack, an atomic FIFO stack, where you push and pop single elements, all right? If you push a single element and pop the whole list all the time, then life is good, but that's not always what you want. And so, I'm not going to go through this in the code in detail, um, but I'll just say that, uh, so this, this was push and this is pop, but it's buggy. Um, and why is it buggy? Well, that's the next slides. So let's say we have a, a top and we've got our list like we had before with, with cat and tux on it. All right, so we now try to pop the upper element and the pop gets preempted. So the pop, this is the first pop, list pop one. It has the old pointer, the pointer next, and it's going to just now take those and feed them to compare swap. The idea being that if the old pointer is the same as top, then it's okay to make the top be the next pointer. And that would kind of automatically pull the cat out of the list and have the list have tucks at the top. Except this got preempted or interrupted or something. It's been delayed. And in the meantime, somebody does a list pop. Well, they pop the top off the list, and now the list just has tucks on it. And the preempted list pop still has the cat, but it's, uh, it's on the free list. Uh, so we've, it's kind of a ghost of the cat at this point. And we can have a second, a third list pop and Tux is gone now. And so both our pointers are pointing off into the free list of these things that used to be real things. And then somebody else might do a list push of dog and happen to reallocate the cat. So now old P points to this thing that's now dog that used to be cat. Um, we'll pretend that the, the compiler could get upset about that and yell at you and, and cause all sorts of ugly things to happen. But let's pretend we have a simple compiler or we've carefully used atomics or something like that to keep the compiler out of the picture. So old P points to dog, but old P next still points to tux. Now let's suppose that the original list pop resumes. Okay, so it's in this state, it's got a pointer to the dog and it's got a pointer to tux. So it does this compare and swap. Hey, guess what? Old P is equal to top, so the compare and swap succeeds. And once we do that, we have a list pointing to the free list, which is a really bad idea. Okay, and this is the dreaded ABA problem. We had uh, kind of a thing where where the where the a given chunk of memory changed roles and caused us problems. And uh, we can prevent this by preventing reallocation of cat. And the way we can do that, um, and I'm not going to go through this in detail but we just put a RC retry critical section around the atomic operation. And this is the thing I was referring to where we're always doing updates, but RCU is still useful. So what's happening here is that if somebody frees the cat out from under us, it can't be reallocated until we get done with the compare and swap. In fact, it can't be reallocated until we get completely done with the compare exchange loop. And so that means that either the compare exchange succeeds and it's the same element it ever was, or, if it's a different element, if it's um, if if that element has been removed from the stack, been popped off the stack, then the compare exchange is guaranteed to fail. All right. So we're using RC readers, and obviously we also have to defer free the nodes. This is a case of not type safe memory, but of um, of existence guarantee to make this work. We have to we have to wait for grace period before each free. And by doing this, we're making it so that the simple NBS code doesn't need to have a whole bunch of other hair that you have to put on it to make it work uh, without deferred reclamation. So this is a, a situation for that lower red triangle we saw earlier in the slide where we're almost always doing updates, but RCU still has a, play, a role to play.
which again would have been a surprise to me 20 years ago. Live and learn. So uh, what we're adding type safe memory here is non-blocking synchronization. And uh, with this, we can go to a quasi reader writer lock, but I'm gonna skip this because we already covered and it just covers a couple of, uh, a couple of things here. And uh, what we'll do instead is look at the multi-version consistency control. Okay. Now, uh, what this does is uh, um, you can kind of think of RCU as, as giving you versions. You know, it's kind of publish, you publish a new version, you do an RCU reference, you subscribe to it, and uh, they may publish a new version and some other reader may get that other version. So you may have, as we saw, you can have multiple readers having different versions at the same time. And that's the spatial synchronization helping us out. So we don't have to have enforce strict and expensive temporal synchronization exclusively. Um, and this is something that's actually used in the Linux kernel. Uh, the dcache, dentry cache uses it, dcache, and it helps with path name lookup. Uh, the way that works is you're given a path name and you want to find the corresponding inode. Um, and what this does is it traverses an in-memory directory entry cache. It does it locklessly. And if something bad happens for a rather surprisingly large number of values of something bad, we fall back to a more heavily synchronized traversal or we may just repeat the lockless traversal depending on what's going on. And uh, one bad thing that happened is that you might be doing a path and you come to a segment that's not in the directory entry cache uh, because it just hasn't been loaded off of disk yet. Now, this code is very complicated. Neil Brown did an excellent LVN series shown on the URLs below. What we're going to do is go through a really amazingly abbreviated version of that code uh, just to show the workings involved with, the, with uh, dealing with the versioning. OK, so first, let's start with what happens if you, just, if, if you don't have the multi-version control in place. Let's say we've got a, a file system that has these two path names. This path name does exist, is one path name, and that thing might not exist as the other path name. And we're looking up this path name does not exist, which uh, uh, truth in advertising, in fact, does not exist. So what's going to happen is we're going to locklessly go down the path. We're RC protected, so we don't have to worry about things disappearing out from under us. So the this finds the this, path name goes ahead, the does finds its thing as well. Um, and then somebody does a move this path name to that. Okay, so we're going to take the, on the left hand side, the path name box over the second one from the top, we're going to move it to have it be under the that, the top box on the right. In other words, like this. Okay, so bang, it's moved over. I'll, I'll do that transformation again. We started here, we did that move command, and we ended up like that. Now, the deentry cache, when you do that, the deentry elements don't change identity. So the pointers we have still work. So the traversal is still looking at that does box, does box down there. Uh, but this wasn't enough. Let's do another one. Let's say we do an MV, that thing might not. So that is the, the not on the right-hand side, the second box from the bottom. And remove it under the that path name does. So the middle box in the middle, the does box there. We're going to do that move. And we're going to do that. In other words, we move the, the not box over under does, and I'm going to repeat that. I'm going to back up and repeat that again, just so you see it. And now the reader continues. Well, hey, there's a not now. Great, we've got it. And guess what? There's also exists. And so what's happened is we've matched this path name. We found an exist thing that goes with that, but that path name never actually existed at any point in time, okay? There never ever was in this whole process of slash this slash path name slash does slash not slash exist. And uh, there have been people that have argued that that behavior is just fine, but uh, a lot of applications really don't like that sort of thing. And the Linux kernel prevents it. Okay, so uh, the Linux kernel does not look up path names that never exist, or at least it, uh, if it does, that's a bug. So how do we avoid this race condition? Well, what we do is we use RCU, but we also use sequence locking. And these again have different roles. RCU makes the lockless traversal safe. It prevents stuff from being freed out from under us. And the sequence locking detects renames. So we can determine if we might've traversed a path that never really existed. And uh, we'll just do a quick, take a quick look at the sequence locking core API. Um, so uh, read seek begin starts a reader. Read seek retry checks to see if there has been an interfering operation. Okay, um, 
and uh, right seek lock starts a writer and right seek unlock ends a writer. And so what happens is that each rename is enclosed in a right seek lock and a right seek unlock. And what that means is if you do a right read seek begin, and by the time you do a, and you do read seek retry, and there's any kind of overlap of any type with that with a rename, the read seek retry will say, hey, you got to retry, something bad happened. So what that means is we can do something like this. This again is brutally simplified. If you want more introduction, there's the Elevian articles again. Of course, the source code is the final authority. So we take a variable seek and assign it read seek begin of, and we got this rename lock we're using. And the renames again are going to do a write seek lock and write seek unlock on that same thing over the rename. We do an RC read lock. And we do a whole pile of complicated stuff to traverse the directory to cache, which may involve going across mount points. It may be involved symbolic links, directories, hard links, the whole show, everything, all the stuff that can happen. And eventually we do a read seek retry. And we are giving it the rename lock again, and we give it the seek we passed in. And if that returns true, something bad happened, and we do something to retry. I haven't given the label for the retry, but we go somewhere and say, hey, something bad happened, we have to deal with it. If reseek try, retry returns false, that means nothing bad happened. We can just do our RC read unlock and declare success and be happy and know that this path name we walked locklessly really did exist uh, during the traversal. Okay, so if we go back to our lookup, uh, this could still happen. We could still go down there and end up with that exist, but we did two renames during the path name lookup. And that means the sequence, the SEQ variable, would be invalid anymore. And so read seek retry would fail at that point and say, hey, you know, yeah, you look this up, but it's wrong. Uh, get out of the pool and, and do something different because this didn't work. And so what's happened is that we've used RCU to make the traversal safe again. Seek lock rejects inconsistent reverse traversals and it rejects traversals that have raced with a rename. And what this is doing is just identifying a version. It's just verifying that the entire read happened within the context of a single version. There, are, we're not going to cover them in this talk. There are more complex schemes that can allow multi concurrent traverses, concurrent consistent traversals of different. Ver I'm doing really well right now. Let's try this again. There are more complex schemes that can allow concurrent traversals of different versions. Uh, this code has been written by, there was an initial uh, shot of it by Manish no, Sony back about 15 years ago. Nick Piggin, uh, sometime later, uh, did an upgrade and Alviro has made it what it is today. Christoph Helwig has been involved in a lot of reviews and upgrades of it. And of course, Neil Brown, as we know, has been, uh, uh, has documented it and possibly done other contributions. So it's a, it's a really impressive piece of code. It's a cool piece of code and kudos to these guys for making it work, keeping it working. And it uh, really does some serious improvement on path name lookup. Okay, and uh, if we're taking RCU and making a quasi multi-version concurrency control, we start with an existence guarantee. We have to have some sort of snapshot operation of the readers, and that was that uh, uh, read seek begin call, which gave us back the seek number. And there has to be uh, constraints on readers and writers. Uh, you could use a single object. Um, we use sequence lock in this example. Uh, there's a whole bunch of schemes that use version numbers, and those allow multiple concurrent readers doing different versions at the same time. And then there's the Issaquah challenge, which has a weaker concurrency, uh, consistency criteria. OK, um, we can go through quasi-reference count. Uh, that's up in the upper corner there. Um, and RCU is kind of a strange thing in that it can be kind of an implicit reference count. You can think of RC dereference as obtaining a reference to the object that's limited to the enclosing RC read side critical section. So the RC dereference, you get an object, you got a sort of funny implicit reference on it, and that reference lives until you do the RC read unlock. You can also think of RC as providing a bulk reference count. You can think of RC read lock obtaining a reference on each and every RC protected object in the system, okay? All of them at near zero cost. But again, you're going to be limited to the enclosing RC reads our critical section. When you get to the matching RCU read it unlock, those references disappear. Now, uh, what's the code look like? Well, actually, you've already seen it. You could take any number of the code samples that we've seen before and interpret it as quasi reference counting. I mean, you had RC read lock, you had RCD reference. You could argue that those were 
taking references as opposed to how else we want to think about it. And that can seem strange. I mean, how can the same code be this is lock and quasi reader writer locking and quasi reference count? What, what's going on here? And the answer is that that's life. Okay. Uh, what is, if you have an atomic ink, what's it doing? Well, that atomic ink might be doing any number of things, right? It might be acquiring a reference count. If you know you've already got a reference on an object, you can do an atomic ink to get another one. So you've got two references to the object. Maybe you want to pass one off to uh, some other thread or something. Um, it might be doing a statistic. You might be counting statistical atomic ink. Hopefully, that statistic is being very rarely counted because atomic ink gets kind of expensive if you do it a lot on with lots of CPUs. But that might be what it is. It might be advancing a concurrent state machine. You can do atomic ink to advance the next state. Okay. Uh, there's any number of things you might be doing with that. So the fact you're using atomic ink doesn't necessarily tell you a whole lot about what the intention is. And the same is true of RCU. All right. Um, RCU has primitives you can use, and you can use the RCU read lock and the RCU do reference, and you can think of it as a reader writer lock, sort of. You can think of it as a reference count, sort of, or as a uh, multi version concurrency control, sort of, right? And a lot will depend. Uh, a lot of times when you're using RCU, you're taking existing code and applying RCU to it. And what what will control really is what the old code was doing. So if your old code was using a reader writer lock, you're probably and are and probably should think that you're using RCU as a quasi reader writer lock. If it started off using reference counts or using RCU to replace those references, then you probably need to think of it as a quasi reference count. If it had some kind of explicit version control and you're using it, using RCU as a lighter weight version control, you probably want to think of it as quasi um, uh, multi version concurrency control. So that's the trick. Uh, if you have some primitive, you can use it a number of different ways atomic ink and RCU, the same sort of thing. So to get from RC to quasi existence, excuse me, quasi reference count, we start with existence guarantee. And we have RC readers as individual or bulk unconditional reference counts acquisitions. And uh, in some cases, you'll want to bridge to a per object lock or reference. Um, for example, you may uh, be using RC as a reference, but need to do something that sleeps, in which case you, if you sometimes need to do that, you might want to acquire a, a physical reference on the object in the object itself and then get out of the RC read side critical section. Networking does things like that uh, to deal with, with uh, uh, round trip delays. All right, so we're here. We've gone through all of these things um, in December and now. Um, uh, so we're, we're, we're through the, the whole list. I want to reemphasize the area of accountability. RCU is easiest to use and works best when you are in a situation where stale and consistent data is OK, and you are mostly reads. And this is why it first started showing up networking. Uh, networking is kind of a poster boy for it. You've got a routing table in networking. But for various reasons, routing information propagates across the internet fairly slowly. If you try to propagate the routing information too quickly, you end up uh, having all sorts of strange failure modes where you can have routes flip back and forth. It, it's pretty ugly. You have packets going around in circles forever. So they artificially slow down the routing updates to uh, promote stability. So that what that means is by the time the routing update reaches the system, you've been sending packets the wrong way for quite some time. And so saying the wrong way for, for a little while longer while the readers get done is not a, really a problem. Um, in some cases, you need consistent data. Read mostly need consistent data. And we saw an example where, where that can happen. Uh, and that is the case where we have a lock on the object. So we use RCU to go through some kind of a search structure locklessly. So if we have a tree, for example, we're avoid avoiding a global lock bottleneck on the root of the tree. We just go use RCU to go through that without a bottleneck. We get locks on the leaves of the tree, which means we can spread the contention across all the leaves of the tree and have fairly low contention. And, uh, and that way, we get the consistency at the leaf where we need it. Um, and don't have massive contention on the search structure itself. Another situation where we have read, write, and need consistent data, uh, RC might be OK. And um, the de-entry cache could be the, considered an example of that. There are a lot of workloads that add and remove files and directories quite frequently. But uh, 
the fact that we're avoiding a massive locking bottleneck on the root inode means that uh, even though we're changing the tree, things are working fairly well. Plus, we're mutating some part of the tree and there's a lot of traffic going through other parts of the tree that's unaffected by the change. So uh, the de-entry cache, an example of the yellow line. We saw an example with the uh, non-blocking uh, data structure with the single element push and pop in the red zone there where it actually does work. Still, um, yeah, I like RCU. I was a co-inventor of it along with Jack Slingwine. I, I, I've had a lot of fun with it, but um, the important thing is to use the right tool for the job. I mean, sometimes RCU is the right tool and that's wonderful and I love that. Uh, but uh, if RCU is not the right tool, you should use something else. So uh, you could argue that RCU is a specialized thing. It is specialized, in fact. I would argue it's specialized. To give an idea of roughly how specialized it is, uh, one useful thing is to compare it to reader writer lock. If you look at the uh, usage of reader writer lock in the Linux kernel, and compare that to RCU, um, the evidence indicates that. Uh, you RCU is well RCU is, is used about uh, four or five times more intensively than reader writer lock. Um, so you could argue that uh, reader writer lock is four or five times more specialized than RCU. On the other hand, normal locking, exclusive locking, is used about ten times more often than RCU. So you could ar argue that there is a uh, spectrum from reader writer locking maybe being the hammer. Uh, RCU being the screwdriver at about a tenth the usage of the locks, and reader writer locking being, uh, I don't know, the spanner or something like that at about a 40th or 50th of exclusive lock or a fourth or a fifth of RCU. Just kind of gives you an idea of where things are overall. And the applicability of RCU, you could, do RCU, you could use our reader writer lock in most of the places to use RCU in theory. But we saw the global agreement this implied by reader red lock as a real problem for multiprocessors. OK, so let's get to the summary. As we saw before, RC synchronizes in time in space as well as time. And the, it's intertwined. So we have the time and space kind of working together and very closely. And that allows us the near zero cost read synchronization. Uh, we went through several example RCU use cases. We've seen them there. Uh, again, as in December, RCU's dirty little secret is that it's dead simple. The semantics are quite straightforward. We saw a slide with those four quadrants with the blue boxes. But in order to make good use of it, you have to change the way you think about your problem. My hope is that these two presentations, the one in December and the one today, help you understand how to think differently about your problem so you can make use of RCU where it makes sense to do so. Again, uh, hopefully this, this helped understand RCU, but there's the old saying, just like in December, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. Um, and uh, being able to see and remember is a useful state to be in. Uh, if all you do is see this, uh, see this presentation, it might help you review code or kind of see what code is doing. But if you really want to get to the bottom of RCU, really seriously understand it, not everybody does, but um, it would be better if more people did, in my opinion, uh, you need to really play with it. Um, it's available in the Linux kernel, of course. So there's also the user space RCU library uh, that you can use if you like using user space debuggers. Uh, you play with it and see what it can do, uh, and do measurements on it. That's a way to really get down and, and take a look at it. So we're here, we're done. They're all blue now because we've covered them all. And uh, uh, we've got this slide, which is the same as December, except uh, it shows you where part one is. So with that, um, uh, open for questions. Uh, thank you for your time and attention thus far and uh, for your interest in RCU. Paul, I have one question. Um, I was wondering if you you mentioned a couple of slides ago that um, RCU, like any other tool, it needs to be applied as it's uh, good for some and good for not good for everything, right? Um, so can you go over maybe some examples in the kernel that you consider um, RCU is apt and RCU, the other uh, side of the coin being RCU is not good? Okay. Good. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so this is the slide you're talking about, right? Correct. Okay, great. So um, I'll give a couple examples. Uh, one of the early wins was security. Uh, 
in the 90s, Linux was just something that was forwarding mail, it was printing, it was uh, doing serving disk, it was being used for general things. Um, and security wasn't a big deal uh, for a couple of reasons. One was that uh, Linux wasn't being used for uh, really important data. And the second was that, this, that the internet was a much more friendly place back then, okay? But as uh, there was enterprise interest in the early 2000s, security became more important. And so, things like security policies got added. And uh, so there were, uh, I think it was Kega Kohai, whose name I just mangled, and uh, I think James Morris, I probably got the wrong name. They, they decided that they were going to add what became SA Linux. And what that meant initially was there's a global lock acquired on each system call. And the problem they had is it was working great on four buys, but you get a 32 buy and, and you know, you, you're just stuck in contention on that lock. Um, and they found out about RCU and applied it and got just massive improvements in performance. And the reason is, of course, you got a security policy, but it was set you know, by some executive at some point. And then it trickles down and people actually implement it. So you've been doing the wrong thing on security for weeks now, probably. And so you know, uh, what's another millisecond or two? And that, and that got them uh, linear scalability. In fact, uh, uh, the the performance penalty for SC Linux it was there you could see it it was but it was you know a few percent as opposed to orders of magnitude so that was one that worked really well um, uh, and uh, at the other end the the deentry cache uh, is something that has worked out much better than I would have expected uh, I, I expected that that we'd have to kind of move and we do move slowly it took a good ten years to get it to where it is today but uh, my pride story on that was at a Linux Conf AU, the first one I attended in 2004. And a bunch of us had dinner um, uh, uh, out at a, and I'm, and I'm flaming out of the guy's house. He's a, he was a BSD hacker, he's now retired. And I'm sorry, I've, I've lost his name. I, I really feel bad about that. In any case, he had us all for dinner up at his house near Adelaide. And uh, he happened to have a BSD system and an identity configured Linux system side by side in his uh, in his office, and of course uh, it didn't take us long to come up with a uh, benchmark, uh, which was uh, which was to do a find across the Linux source tree. So we put a Linux took a tarball, put a Linux source tree on both machines, the BSD machine, and the Linux machine, and uh, did a find on both of them uh, with some other stuff going on. I, I don't remember the exact benchmark, but it completed in ten seconds on Linux. And many minutes later, it was still running on the BSD system. Okay. Um, and uh, Linus happened to be there and he looked at me and said, I'm very proud of our decache system. And uh, uh, that I can't tell you how good that felt. Hear him say that. Um, all I did was provide uh, RCU at that point. Uh, the decache itself was Manish Sony's work. And Nick and Al, of course, picked it up later. Okay. So, what's not so good about RCU? Give an example where it doesn't work. One we've had problems with so far, and uh, uh, we're working on it, is MAPSEM. Okay, that's a reader writer semaphore. Um, and uh, there's some work going on to try to help things along. Uh, Peter Zilstra in 2010 started the SPF, the speculative page fault. Um, Laurent Dufour took it over a few years ago, and Michel Lepinas has uh, taken over more recently. So it's, you know, this has been going on for like 12 years. Uh, there was also a uh, MIT research effort that uh, did something that made it uh, use RCU, but had uh, performance uh, degradations in some workloads, some unfortunately important workloads. That was in 2003 ASPLOS, 2013 ASPLOS, excuse me. And so uh, uh, the speculative page fault path uh, attempts to do this page fault without acquiring a map sim and uses various techniques to figure out that that didn't work and uh, does it the hard way of uh, acquiring, reacquiring a map sim if it has to. Another, uh, another piece is, uh, and this is uh, Matthew Wilcox and Liam Howlett, they've been working on the maple tree variant, which allows part of the search to be done under RCU protection. And uh, I believe it avoids a fallback path. Um, uh, and uh, and those two patch sets uh, are, are something that is moving towards that uh, goal. SPF turns out to be really helpful for Android. It has 20% you know, speed ups in application launch time, which the, so much so 
that many of the Android vendors apply SPF as an out of tree patch. If you're running an Android, you probably have that. You're probably running that patch if it's a recent Android. So you know um, it's being used in production, even though it's having a hard time making the mainline. So we'll see how things go with that. Uh, another one is something that's applied partially, um, and this is uh, uh, PowerPC uh, has RCU protection on the page tables, the page table structures. Uh, and doing that would allow lockless slash proc entries. But these are, and it, uh, so these are things where, where RC has been difficult, it hasn't been used in the past. We may be able to partially cover MAPS them, but, we, ha but we, we don't have any ambitions to completely eliminate it at this point in time. Maybe we can get there at some time. So the uh, MM system with the MAPS them is one example where RC has, has had some difficulty. Uh, there are probably some other ones. That's the one that comes to mind immediately. That's a good question, though. And uh, I don't expect, uh, I actually had a question. I was giving an academic presentation in, the, in 2012. One of the guys said, OK, so when's RC taking over the world? And, and I said, yeah, no, it's not going to. I mean, we use exclusive locks for updates, for example. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very useful tool. It's gotten a lot of use, and uh, I'm very happy. I'm happy for it to get more use, but um, I'm also happy to learn about other synchronization primitives and how they can make things work. So good question. Other questions? Thank you for explaining that. That's, that's great, because uh, uh, um, I know we talk about RCA a lot, and we use it a lot in the kernel. Um, it, this gives me a um, good picture of uh, when it's useful. And, and another and, way to find more of them would be just to look up uh, read lock and write lock and, uh, you know, uh, the uh, various semaphore and mutex read side uh, primitives and take a look and see what's there. <laughs> right. OK, great. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, happy to wrap this up. Thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you, Paul, for presenting on this topic. And thank you, Shua, for being here and addressing questions for us. Um, we hope to see everyone at a future mentorship session. And um, this recording will be up on our YouTube later today. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great day.